It's a well-known observation among people who use or have tried themselves or th- uh, practitioners who use a ketogenic diet that people seem to be able to lose weight um, more readily and for a longer duration of time mm. than when employing a calorie-restricted diet, particularly one which is high enough in carbohydrates that it prevents nutritional ketosis. And so there's multiple published studies with calorie-restricted diets, say 1,200 or 1,400 calories a day, which mm-hmm. for the average heavy person induces a 1,000 calorie per day deficit. Yeah. That as the diet goes on, mm. hunger and cravings increase. Yeah. And so there is essentially a some termination point driven by physiological hunger. Your ability to resist. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of like resisting a slow, inexorable force. Eventually, right. it gets the better of you, and you you abandon the diet. No matter how stoic you are. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there are people who can do this for six months and lose a lot of weight. Right. So it's rare that anybody goes beyond six months with a purposeful calorie restriction. Yeah. You know, there's some of the calorie-restricted longevity advocates hmm. who can – on average, do this for years, but they're very rare. Yeah. They're very rare that people can do that. Yeah. So, you have a, a crescendo of subtle, I mean, cravings and you know, overt hunger, mm-hmm. yeah. symptoms that build over time. Yeah. And most people see the opposite for uh, for six months or longer mm. uh, with a well-formulated ketogenic diet. And many people, ex- you know, experience this reduction in hunger and cravings. You know, the appetite is there. You know, a couple times a day they feel, you know, a need to eat and are satiated, but it's it's rarely as compelling as as what builds up as one follows a prolonged calorie restricted non ketogenic regimen. Yeah. There was some elegant research done in the nineteen fifties, back when you know post World War II there was there wasn't a whole lot of research money available and there was yeah. a, a a remarkable a uh, scientist in the UK named uh, Professor John Garrow. Okay. And he had a g- country escape place, maybe in, in, a, 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 in a village in, in uh, the Scottish Highlands. Right. And there were about 300 people who lived in this village. Mm-hmm. And he would go there for a few weeks or a month every summer, I mean, whatever that three-week window was of summer in Scotland. <laughs> right. And, you know, it was just a place to go and get away from the city, from, from London. Mm. But since he was there, he'd bring along a scale. Mm-hmm. And he weigh everyone in the village. Okay. Year after year, he weighed everyone in the village, and and, and took their names, so he knew. Yep. Right. And and uh, they all knew him, and yeah. he knew them. He was a crazy <laughs> professor from from London. And the man with the scale. The man with the scale, <laughs> and and he would record their weight year after year, and mm. you know, kids and adolescents gained weight. Uh, women, when they uh, uh, were pregnant, gained weight. Mm-hmm. If, you know, perhaps they retained a few pounds after each pregnancy. Mm-hmm. But for barring pregnancy and barring uh, major illness or disease in the adults, their weights were remarkably stable for years and even decades at a time. Wow, yeah. Now, the average adult eats somewhere between 750,000 and a million calories a year. And yet mm. their bodies, you know, a, a normal weight adult body will contain anywhere from 50 to 100,000 calories. So people were eating 10 to 20 times their weight and energy each year, yeah. and yet their weight was just staying stable within a few pounds. Right. And they weren't counting calories. Yeah. Nobody was saying, eat this much or eat that much, yeah. which implies that we, we under unperturbed circumstances, Without we, derangement. Yeah. we as adults have internal instincts that let us get within 1%. That's a of, remarkable of our daily energy intake yeah. year in and year out. That's a remarkable accuracy. Yeah. And there are some people who are gaining persistently, but mm-hmm. you know, this is the 50s and yeah. we didn't have a huge amount of sugar and re- you know, highly refined carbs and particularly in Scotland, you know, and mm, sure. you can't get fat eating haggis, you know. <laughs> so we clearly, when you get the even a, a carb-containing diet, right? Most people have homeostatic mechanisms that are very precise and are instinctive. Yeah. So what we seem to have discovered mm. is that when we get people on a well-formulated ketogenic diet, we recreate those instinctive mechanisms, but not at the weight that you're at now, but by inducing nutritional ketosis, somehow that sets 
the, the new target for the body's homeostatic mechanism at a lower level. Right. People have called that the set point. And, yeah. Uh, and uh, I think we should call it a settling point because it's settling because mm. you can change it by changing diet composition. Yeah. Uh, but nutritional ketosis seems to induce a new settling point for people mm. that may not be exactly where they want to be, but a lot lower than where they are in a insulin resistant, particularly with diabetes or metabolic syndrome uh, disease state. 